Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a couple of projects to speak about this afternoon. Um, pretty small scale. Um, a little evaluation done in St Andrews. A kind of a good example of the sort of work that my, my smaller units tend to do. And after that, uh, a community excavation in Cooper. So the first one is in the centre of St Andrews. And the location here, you can see um, Market Street, Church Street over here, South Street to the south. And if you can just make out this red shaded area in the middle, this is the area for the development, construction of a small two-bedroom, one-storey house. Um, surrounded on all sides by buildings. Quite a dark little corner, but clearly um, an important location if you want to get on the property ladder in St Andrews. So we were um, asked by Fife Council to do a small evaluation, essentially, just in the footprint of the building, which was fairly small, and a little bit of monitoring on some of the drainage works. And so one of the first things we did was look at the early map coverage. Roy's map up here. This is the site here between South Street and Church Street. Over here, the Ordnance Survey First Edition, you can see this red shaded area at the back. And to the bottom, one of these uh, lovely one to 500 town plans. You can see the site of the old Market Cross there, the White Melville Fountain over there. And this is the, the site in fairly comprehensive detail, actually. You can see a, a glass house here, an interesting feature with a little dog leg in it going out of the, the lane out to the church street here, a couple of trees, a little path, and if you note here, it says in here, cinerary urns found 1867 and 1872. And it wasn't until we looked at this particular edition that we discovered this. This wasn't on the HER, either local or national. So it just goes to show there are things out there on maps that aren't actually known about. This is the site pre-excavation. This is this lovely back court where somebody wants to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on a little house. Um, you can see these brick-built structures. These are clearly sort of mid-20th century, these things here. Um, the other thing that we found was you've got this large accumulation of, of uh, soil in the center. Now, what we're thinking is that when they, when they built these um, brick extensions, rather than trying to remove all the soil through the narrow venal, they've just piled it all in, in the center. So that was something that was going to have to be removed under archaeological supervision. So here we see it removed under archaeological supervision. And you can just see down on the bottom, bottom side here, the start of a little wall. And take note of this drainage feature over there. Once cleaned up, we seem to have a, a sandstone gully, which corresponds with the, the feature on the 1 to 500 plan, which actually exited down the, down the venal. So, and alongside that, this, this large wall here. It's just looking from the, the north back to the, the wall. Up in the northwest corner, um, while this was, this, this was monitored, we, were, we had a fairly tight area in which we were sat actually investigating. But up against this um, western end, we were supposed to be monitoring the insertion of a drain. The site director, Sophia Black, um, was told to come back in a couple of days when the work was going to start again. She came back and found that the contractors, a new foreman, had decided to go ahead and dig this drain anyway. Um, this is this guy here looking very sheepish at the back. Um, once Sophie had cleaned this up, they'd actually laid it right into, directly into a, st a stone basin. Now this, this was actually our only remit up at this part of the, of the site, was to monitor this, this drainage. You can see once it's been cleaned up, we've got a, you know, a lot of burnt material um, some sandstone slabs, possible ground surface, and quite a lot of white gritty wear came from around this area. Here's the stone basin all cleaned up. Not sure of the function, but probably a water trough. There was actually, it's not, you can't see it because of the way the slides come in there, but there's actually a, a hole at the bottom where presumably animals were tied up. This is it being removed, several hundred weight, this thing. I mean, it was a, an absolute nightmare to um, remove, so we had to get the guys to help us there. But that was unfortunately um, 
all the excavation that's going to happen up there. But if you look at the area, where the area that the machine is sitting on, that's actually where the house is going to go. And that was our kind of remit. That's the kind of area that we are attempting to evaluate. And it's, we can't go without outside that area because it's not going to be affected by the construction. So it didn't leave as much room. This is a, a post-ex plan. Up in the northwest corner here, you can see the stone, stone basin bit of, bit of um, slab. This is where we retrieved the pot from, but that was essentially all we could look at up there. This is the kind of larger area in which the house is going to go that we were able to look at. We were cleaning the topsoil back and up here we found this some stones set around a central hole. Down here, this is a, a trench which we opened up laterally, but paying attention to this up here, this turned out to be a, a bottle well. Um, this, this is fairly well on an excavation, actually. The, 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 the hole at the top was here, but we've had, we had to get the, anything out of it. We had to remove all this here and step down into it. Um, doesn't look like much, but that's actually about two metres deep there. And my daughter was out helping us with us, and so she was down in there digging it. And uh, that's when I started to get a bit jittery looking down or crouching down. I, I'm, I'm sure that there was plenty of structural integrity, but it was, it was getting very difficult to, to get anything out of here. There was a... There's a building over here on the right-hand side. Um, this is the edge of the building here. It was getting very dangerous to dig it, so we, we were only able to go down two metres. Um, what we did find in here was mainly 19th, 20th century kind of um, refuse, glass, uh, bottles, uh, milk bottles, whiskey bottles, that sort of stuff, so fairly modern material. Um, a similar well to this was actually excavated at Prior Gate in St Andrews. They were able to excavate the thing much deeper than we were. A similar profile, you see this, the profile of this thing here. Only 30 centimetres of an opening at the top. Um, so they actually didn't, they didn't consider it to be a well. It's difficult to see what else it could, could be, really, if anybody else has got any ideas. This is it, uh, another, just a, a clearer shot showing the interior. And you can see the material into which this thing's been built. This, this kind of homogenised kind of mortar rich material so we're thinking probably 17th 18th century we're not we're not really going to know again it was difficult we couldn't we we had a a depth to which we were a maximum depth which we were allowed to go because of the foundations of the building we couldn't really go beyond that and we were very restricted for space so this is a drawing of the the trench um which we opened up down just a couple of metres to the southwest of that of the well, just to get an idea on what on the deposits. This is the photograph of the of the, the previous drawing. Here's the bulk. The red uh, material is the red sand subsoil. You've got this cut running here. Inside this cut, um, that that was part of a excavation down here, so that a lot of that material has been removed. But very confused uh, dump material and lots and lots of pottery coming out of this area, mainly white gritty, um, and one or two other interesting little shards. But it was very difficult for us to kind of make much sense. But it, it looks like it's, it, it's probably approximately on the on the Burgage um, plots. So we're just on the, on that cusp. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to, to do much more work than we were than we were able. Here's some of the the pottery. Looking at these. This handle here in particular, you see these little stab holes in it? They're to help um, diffusion of heat. And it looks very like the, the pot that um, Julie has showed us earlier, actually. It's probably a similar handle. There's another handle with the same stabs in it. Some white gritty with some brown decoration on it. And one of these uh, Scarborough wares. And just um, Derek was able to identify that this kind of came from here. So. That's that on that one. Just a, a little note on that. So let me see. Peter says no. Uh, how can I get this to go from the beginning?
Okay. Um, the next one was uh, a community excavation carried out by myself and Pete Clement of AKD Archaeology. And I apologise to anybody in the audience who might have seen the talk that was given on this in Cooper Town Hall um, two, three years ago. Um, this was an excavation at East Moat Hill in the centre of Cooper. A project very like Gavin's, um, this one run by the Cooper Conservation Area Regeneration Scheme, Townscape Heritage Initiative, um, funded by Historic Environment Scotland and kind of helped along, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, Fife Council, and um, Doug and Steve helped us with that also. The five-year programme, again, delivers, delivered a number of elements in building projects, public realm improvements, training, apprenticeships, and community engagement, of which uh, our excavation was one. That's the same, the same thing there. So the site is to the north of um, Cooper. There's the Bonnie Gate running east to west there. There's Cooper Cross. And here's the East Moat Hill. It's an irregular low ridge aligned east-west and located within a bend of the Ladyburn. See the Ladyburn coming down here. Um, and we put in four trenches just to try and evaluate what was going on with this thing. Up in the, up in the northeast, there was a long spur emanating, which we, this trench one was designed to kind of capture that and have a look at that. Trenches two and three down this east flank, see if there was any features on there. And up on the top, the, um, there's a, a, a square kind of level area into which we were going to be putting a trench. For those who don't know about Moat Hills, they are um, an interesting kind of Western Europe medieval feature. Um, associated with places of, mid of assembly, where open air councils were held and justice was dispensed. The Norse version is called Tings, English Moot Hills, and Gaelic Cuthils. Um, the, Moat Hills derive their name from the Scots word moot, a formal meeting or assembly, an action or case at law, or a cause or plea. They tended to be associated with feudal justice from the 12th century onwards, although many probably had much earlier origins. There's a tradition of open-air assemblies and courts, often on hillocks and widespread across early medieval Europe. Most of the examples are on low natural features, occasionally sited on early prehistoric sites, usually with a flattish leveled area or a terrace, which is um, why we were investigating the, the Cooper example. Um, Cooper is obviously a, an important place in, med in the medieval period, a centre of um, legality and justice. The historical references to the courts at Cooper mostly relate to this site, which during the late medieval period was also known as the Came Hill. Um, and it's considered that um, Dr. Olivier, Olivier O'Grady, um, who sadly died, um, this, a lot of this research is taken from his PhD. Um, and he probably he suggested that this, the main period of use for this thing was from the 12th to the 15th century. Again, this is just repeating what I've just said. You, know, you can read it through if you want again. Um, so, early maps. This is um, Gordon's 1642 map. You can see the Moot Hill up here. This map's orientated east-west. And there's a Moot Hill mentioned down here. John Wood's town plan of 1820. You can see a, a bit of artistic license with this ridge. But again, you can see the Lady Burn, and there's this path running along the ridge. Ordnance of the first edition. So there's a trig point up the top there, the Moat Hill. And another one of these uh, lovely uh, town plans, this one from 1854. And if you can, I don't know if you're able to make out all these little dots here and lines. And they probably, they actually correspond to what, the, there's a drying pool. This is a communal drying game. Previous archeological work had taken along at the, the western end of this. Russell Coleman in 1996 undertook a watching brief when they were widening this road and they found evidence of quarrying and dumping of a lot of domestic rubbish and so on. And again, here's a bit more detail of our trenches, one, two, three, and number four up at the top, where we were hoping to pick up some of the, any features on, this, on the leveled summit. Some happy volunteers there. who just had coffee and biscuits, so they're, they're, they're good for an hour or so anyway. Trench one, um, it's at the top, there was a, you can see this kind of spur. Um, 
once we got underneath the topsoil, it, as usual with a the slope, there was a lot of accumulation of topsoil type material at the bottom of the trench, so we put in these boxes just to just to identify that. And a few finds in, in here, but no, no nothing structural. Um, this little pit feature, um, filled with fairly modern finds, once we tallied that with the early drying green, uh, drying poles, that was probably a, 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 a drying pole location. Up at the top of the trench, this possible bank material, uh, what we found was probably dumped material, but it was kind of very topsoily. It wasn't kind of um, a lot of natural material, but certainly some sort of topping to this ridge. You can see it in the right section, but you can see it's, it's a very similar color to the topsoil, fairly mixed. Um, difficult to see what, what its function was. Finds. Um, Trenches two and three produced a lot of finds. We had a, a metal detector, so it was a, a great help. We found a lot of these coins on, tre on the trenches two and three, probably because, the, because of the slope. People are sitting on the slope and the coins are falling out of their pockets, potentially. Um, here's some of the other finds. We've got some musket balls. We found a few three cartridge and a flint from the flint lock, as well as little scribers for slates. Potentially the kids were getting taken out to do a bit of outdoor lessons and a, a fair amount of um, military hardware. Um, one of the interesting things that, that we found when we were excavating was it, it's, it's quite a common route for people to come from Cooperstown Centre to the north. And you know, in conversation with them, we were explaining about moat hills and what their function was. And, and the old guys, the kids, this is where we come for a square go. They're all, this is where in Cooper, if you get any problem with someone, if you're gonna see someone after school, this is where people ended up. So there's that uh, tradition, which is still ongoing. Dispute resolution of a different kind, you know. Here's trenches two and three, fairly uninteresting, just the coins came out of them, no features. That left trench four on the summit. It was coming towards the end of the excavation. And as you can see, you can see the path here, the trees on the top, this was a little kind of keyhole that we were able to put into the, the summit. So we got the, the guys to start removing this uh, fibrous, turfy material all by hand. <coughs> um, and working on, working on, and it was, it was quite difficult to get this stuff off and we were really running out of time. We'd left the Saturday morning was supposedly backfilling. But as you can see, we still had, even though we'd excavated a, a fair bit out, we hadn't actually hit what we were safely happy with was natural subsoil. Eventually, we split the, the trench up, had two bulks, had two teams on either side, and then we just concentrated on this, this uh, up north west corner. In that northwest corner, we were just beginning to see potentially what was, the, what was the natural because it was drying out more quickly than all this. You see this darker material here. So we said, right guys, we need to just put the sondage in here and at least just chase the natural down. So the, the, the plan is to just chase this natural, see where the cut's going, see how deep the feature is. So off they went, started digging down, down 800 mil, and we start getting little bits of cremated bone. So we got it all cleaned up. We managed to sample some of the cremated bone, some of the material there around it, from which we got uh, a pig bone and some cremated bone. It looks, from what we can gather, it looks like this might have been just put in, in a sack, so it's not within a pot or anything. But certainly, it's, it, you know, Bronze Age inhumations are known as, you know, just a simple cremation. So, at the base of the pit, well, well, only, I mean, you talk about keyhole excavation. You can't get more, much more keyhole than this. I mean, this was actually, I mean, it was so lucky that we managed to just nick this thing and on the last day. And also, from that, we got a rare really carbon date to 750 BC, 1750 BC, transition from early to middle Bronze Age. And the bone that was recovered was assessed as being from a pig. So, and what else did we find? We found a couple of fragments of metal, tiny fragments. There's a suggestion there might have been bronze rivets for a dagger. Um, and there was also three small fragments of, of chipped stone, or quartz actually. Um, the rock crystal looks like it had been worked with conchoidal features and a bulbar percussion. 
and the brown smoky quartz had possible evidence for retouch. Regarding the peg, this is actually more common than, than I, I knew of, actually. Uh, quite often you get joints of lamb or peg put in with an inhumation. So there's one from Long Nidre, Gearney Bank in Kinross, Cruden in Aberdeenshire. So it, it's something that's known about. But we were, I mean, it was amazing that we actually managed to get that much information from basically uh, a very small sample. And once we, once we found that, we started re-evaluating the trench, the rest of the trench, and what we could see was that there was probably another feature here. Around in the blue circle, there was a red sandstone slab. Um, so we really wanted to go back, um, but there wasn't very much money in the first place for this excavation. There was just enough money to do the redecarbon date and a little bit of um, post-excavation. Um, but sadly, we weren't able to go back, but at least now, we know that where there are, there are Bronze Age um, features. So that demonstrates the medieval role of Cooper's Moat Hill is significant, and also it's, it's fantastic we're able to see that there's prehistoric foundations for the Moat Hill. So that's all, all good. And it'd um, be great to go back. We'll see if there's any money for that. Thank you. And thank you for the wee kingdom for letting us <laughs> use their lose.